Moore, who is uh, an ARS here at the National Ag Library, and she's going to talk to us about a recent, is it recent or uh, a current effort uh, called the Ag Data Commons. This is something that's very relevant uh, to data science and all of some of the things that we've been talking about for the entire week, so it really is timely uh, to have her come and share uh, the work that's being done here with us. So, Cindy, thank you. So my first question is, how many of you were at my talk on Monday? Can you raise your hands? Yeah, so I knew that there was a fair amount of overlap, so I've changed the talk slightly, so you'll just have to pay attention, see what parts are different. Um, and I also, that first time, did not have the benefit of Sean Davis's talk coming the day before mine. So a lot of what Sean talked about yesterday is very similar in concept to what I'm interested in. Um, and so keep that in mind as I talk, and I'll try to point out where we are in that vision that he talked about yesterday. So the Ag Data Commons is the primary topic of, of what I'm going to say, but I want to say a little bit about the library and why the library is doing this. So we've been around uh, as a library since 1862, and the mission has actually not changed since then. The legislation charges us uh, with uh, acquiring and diffusing among the people of the United States useful information on subjects connected with agriculture and rural development. And we are still doing that. That has not changed. Of course, what has changed is the technology and the details about how we do that. And so about five years ago, we created a new division here at the library called Knowledge Services Division. And the goal is to advance knowledge discovery, particularly using scientific data sets, and uh, also to make data sets accessible by developing data transformation and visualization tools. And so the Ag Data Commons, which is the project that I lead here at the library, is, is essentially the embodiment of those goals. Um, if you go to this website, you'll see that uh, it's in beta. We've been working on this for the last three years or so, basically refining our requirements, doing a little exploratory work, getting some information up there, and making sure that the concept of a self-submission catalog was actually going to work. But actually, this is an ecosystem of platforms. So I'll be talking primarily about one platform, DCAN, but if you think about it more broadly, this is a, a general catalog that, that connects repositories in a lot of different uh, places. So why are we doing this? So the vision, um, hang on just a second. Sorry about that, I wanna make sure I don't forget all the details. So the vision um, is first to gather together the agricultural information, transform it into knowledge, and then make sure that farmers and producers and citizens can translate that knowledge into action. And so the three points here on this trajectory, gather, transform, and translate together are harnessing the power of digital agriculture. And I know these are buzzwords that have come up already in your meeting, um, but we basically are primarily concerned with uh, allowing for bigger and better science that will have the maximum impact on society. But there's also some more immediate near-term goals which relate to those FAIR principles that, that Sean talked about yesterday. The first one is the federal directives that came out uh, in 2013, 2014, um, that there has to be public access to open, machine-readable government data and also research data. And so, so we do have some mandates from above that say we have to do this. But there's also recognition that doing this is important for scientific integrity. So preventing fraud, making sure that results are reproducible. You've heard this sort of thing before. This was a recent report that came out from the National Academy of Sciences. And it, it call, I, what I've called out here specifically is the role that effective um, research data management uh, and transparency is very important to this process. But not only the data, but also models and code. And so I'll, I'll come back to that later. Um, and then I've also highlighted the emphasis on uh, consistent with disciplinary standards and also funder requirements. Now, we did an analysis uh, earlier this year. We went to the journals that we know that USDA researchers are publishing in um, and looked at the top 50 journals, the ones that had the most papers from USDA researchers, and looked at their policies with respect to data. 
It turns out that 22% of those journals require the data to be open that underlie those, those research papers, um, and another 34% encourage the data to be made available. So that basically means that uh, you are probably already experiencing this when you're submitting your papers for publication. You are asked to either provide the data as supplemental data or to provide a digital object identifier where somebody can go get the data associated with your paper. So that's sort of the stick. You don't get published unless you actually make the data available. Um, the problem is, is that researchers don't have a lot of options for where to put their data, um, specifically uh, in domain-specific databases. So we also did a survey of where agricultural researchers are putting their data. We have a list of 77 repositories that include some ag data, and we also have 235 what I would consider domain-specific databases, where everything in the database has to do with agriculture. And if you look at those and, and what their submission policies are, only 17% of them are actually open for any researcher. Most of these are custom platforms that only the people who are associated with a particular project or perhaps a particular university can utilize. So there aren't that many options. You know, obviously GenBank and, and other NCBI uh, databases are in that blue area where they will take data from outside, but, but for the most part, the very specific, domain-specific databases are not open to everyone. And this is a figure that's actually kind of scary. Um, we did a survey of ARS researchers last year, and we were trying to get a handle on how much data is out there and how is it being managed. And this is just one of the results from that survey. And we asked people, where are you actually storing your data? And we gave them options and they could pick as many options as they wanted. Um, the scary part is all those big bars. Those are the local hard drives, external hard drives, maybe a shared network drive. Um, data repository is down there, halfway down. So very few of the data are actually making it into a properly professionally managed repository. Um, and the scariest one is the bottom, I don't know. <laughs> um, but interestingly, you know, a lot of the data are actually stored on the hard drives of instruments. That's probably true of you all, and, and that may actually be something we can leverage down the road. So the Ag Data Commons concept, this is a, a diagram of the concept, is the following. So all those things that are in blue are existing things that are already are out there. So different repositories of different topics that are either managed by federal agencies, by universities, or potentially even by industry. So one to N, lots of different repositories are already out there. Um, data producers who might be getting their data from farm equipment or experimental devices or you know, straight off the farm will deposit into those repositories or maybe straight into uh, what we call the Ag Data Commons. The stuff in green is what we're actually building right now and we have in beta online. And that is to provide a discovery interface to all the data, which requires that we have a catalog, that we know where things are, that will provide APIs, application programming interfaces, so that machines can talk to all of these resources. Um, and then down the road, computational tools and data analytic tools, um, and basically build up a knowledge base from all of that activity so that data consumers can take advantage of it. So that's the concept. Um, I just wanted to pull out a, a few of the specific cases that we're working with already. We know there's a lot of resources at NCBI. We'll be working with those. Um, I found out about uh, Genomes to Fields on Monday. Uh, and so we know that there are a lot of existing repositories out there. So the cataloging software they're using right now is called DCAN. Um, this is uh, a good idea because it's, an, it's, it's built on the open source Drupal platform, which is probably the most widely used content management system around the world. Um, it's got a huge community of developers that know how to use it. DCAN itself is built on top of that, and it has uh, a lot of the features that, that you need for managing data and data sets. Um, now, DCAN itself was created for open government data. So if you go to the state of California, they're using DCAN to expose the information about all their state uh, government data sets, which is great. There are a lot of customers that are using DCAN already, but most of them are not research organizations. So what we've done, and it's, it's here on the right, you don't need to see the details, what we've done is we've customized DCAN to better support research data. And that means adding things like authors, adding citations to literature, um, making sure that there's uh, 
specific kinds of metadata that, that may not necessarily be part of the, the usual for, for a government. So we are working to make the, the research data distribution available for any organization that wants to use it. So our philosophy is that the data should live where uh, the particular community that needs it will find it and use it. So we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We don't want to replace any of those existing repositories. They're, they're great. They're already serving their community. Um, and at the same time, the people who own the data, whether it's in one of these external repositories or in our repository, they know where the data live and they can create the best metadata for the central catalog. And so therefore, we've got this self-submission system where we have a form that you can fill out, shouldn't take very long, but you're the best people to do it. Um, or if it's already has metadata in some other external repository, we can harvest that metadata. And uh, I just had a brief conversation with Sean earlier about you know, how, hard, how high should that metadata bar be? Um, and we're sort of aiming for a sort of moderate level of metadata. We're a very general catalog. We actually have information spanning um, everything from genomics to hydrology to economics. And we can't possibly have the super detailed kind of metadata that you might find in GenBank, for example. We just, we just have too many special, specialized kinds of data. That said, we want it to be higher than just your average, for example, card catalog for a publication. So, so we do need additional information about the data, in particular, any data dictionaries, particularly machine readable ones, any information about methods that are used, in particular citations to the papers that describe those methods, um, and links to any specific software or equipment that were used to generate the data. And partly the reason we ask for that is it makes it easy for people to find other data sets that have similar characteristics. So if, if you want to know who else has used my particular brand of sequencer or my particular methodology for extracting DNA, um, you would be able to do that because the information is kept with the data in a structured way. And then the last point here is that we have a team of curators upstairs that are providing that overarching um, quality control on the metadata, not the data, but on the metadata to make sure that the, the, the descriptions of the data sets are as consistent as possible. All right, making it machine readable is a high priority for us. So on the left there, you can see what the web page looks like for a particular resource. And there is a lot of text there, which is useful. But we're also trying to structure as much of that text as possible um, by asking for these specific uh, kinds of metadata, and that way we can serve back the metadata in JSON or RDF, um, and actually we can serve back the data in RDF, I'm sorry, in JSON as well if it's tabular. So, so DCAN out of the box will provide an API to a data file itself if it's row and column. Um, in addition, we're encouraging data dictionaries to be machine readable, not just a PDF with a lot of text that explains what's in the data file, but actual you know, CSV files that, that are very um, structured. Um, finally, we're, we're emphasizing that as many links as possible to related APIs or related databases or uh, code repositories on GitHub uh, will be associated with, with each data set. The other thing that we're doing that is dif different than most of the open government data sites is that we're providing rich linkages to PubAg. Um, so PubAg is another project here at the library um, that makes uh, full text articles um, available to everyone along with uh, some citations to peer reviewed literature. So if, if you're familiar with PubMed and PubMed Central, this is basically filling both of those roles. Um, and these uh, citations that are out there to the literature are enhanced with um, subject analysis and application of terms from a SCOS thesaurus that is semantic. So, so we're adding value to uh, the records of each publication. And in the future, um, there will be some advanced search capability. There will be a, a better API to PubAg. They will start uh, um, including the last acceptable manuscripts for uh, availability for text mining and, and applications like that, and additional metadata. And in addition, at the library, we are planning to integrate not only PubAg, but Ag Data Commons and everything else we have into a single search uh, interface to facilitate discovery. 
All right, so the title of my talk mentions a one-stop shop, and I think that concept has come up already in your, in your workshop. So we have been asked by leadership to spend the next, uh, well, it, it was a three-month effort, and we're now halfway through it, to completely catalog as much as possible all of the data products that have been produced with support from the REE mission area of USDA. And so that includes ARS, that includes NAS, that includes the Economic Research Service, and it does include NIFA, although we've already indicated that we know that that's going to be a much heavier lift, so, so we're not promising to have that by the end of the year. Um, but in particular, what we're looking for is what's already out there but scattered. So we know that there's a lot of custom databases. We know that there's a lot of people who just put a link to their data on their website. We want to know where all of that is. Um, and if there is something that is this close to being released publicly, go ahead and do it if you can, because then it'll be part of this one-stop shop. Um, and so we are pushing through the end of this year for that. But of course, we'll continue beyond that. So the questions that I have for you all are, what are the major databases and data sets that we might be missing? So take a look, see if there's something that you know or that you use or that you manage that we should have. Um, we've already done a, a survey uh, using our uh, various search capabilities and we found, uh, as I said earlier, 77 repositories and over 200 databases around the world, not all of which were produced with USDA funding. But what have we missed? Um, I know that it's already been discussed and, and we'll need to have continuing conversations about this. For your community, how much of the data and what kind of data needs to be maintained for how long? So for now, we're not necessarily going to hold your data. We'll know where it is and we can start to make decisions about what's the data that we need to preserve for the long, long term and what are we going to need in order to do that. Um, so as I said, we're focusing for now on that first step, the gathering, the, the, the cataloging of things, and a lot of this is going to involve harvesting metadata from other repositories. And so I would like to know from you all, what are those repositories for the data sets that you care about? Um, where have you already cataloged your data? We need to know that we've got a list of things. We can do a few in the next um, month or so, but we'll need to have a list to keep going back to. And we can set these up to harvest on a regular basis, and that will avoid any um, duplicate effort. We also want to know what are the ontologies and data dictionaries that are already in existence that relate to your data. So this is just a random ontology I pulled off the web. Um, I know that there's uh, specific, you know, obviously gene ontology will be important for you all. Um, I know there's a variety of, of phenotype ontologies that are under development and they link together in certain ways. I'm involved in a couple of those. Um, but what is the best way to tie these particular data sets to those more semantic resources because that will help us um, improve the usefulness uh, of that information for future research. And, and what can the Ag Data Commons do to help promote shared usage of these standards. Instead of creating a new one, maybe we can point out uh, which are the most frequently used ontologies and standards so that people have a better starting point rather than creating something new. They're jumping on the bandwagon <clears throat> and they know what other people are using. All right, this is my jet engine of science uh, figure where you put the raw data in one end, it goes through a lot of fancy processing and out the other end comes a citable publication. So clearly this is a complex thing in here. The Ag Data Commons is not going to uh, touch on every aspect of what happens to data as you go from data to publication, but what are the points that we, what are the gaps that we can fill? What are the transformations that you think uh, nobody else is providing? What are those services that, that Sean talked about yesterday that, um, that we can provide that add value to that data that aren't being done by somebody else um, and that would help your research? So uh, my last big question is how are we going to work with big data? Um, how many of you are using SciNet? This is the ARS big data system. I see a couple of hands. So this is, this is just starting out. This is the infrastructure that ARS folks have available to them. How many people are using Cyverse? 
Okay, another few people. So there's other big data resources out there. Um, this is another scattered thing. How do we work as a long-term archive of data? How do we work well with those existing computational infrastructures? Okay, so I'm just gonna summarize um, that we are on this trajectory of our vision, which is towards translating data into actual impact for society. We're still down at that first dot. We're down at the gathering stage. But what I'm asking you to do is help think about, and maybe you'll articulate in your blueprint, where do we go from here to help in that transformation and that translation processes? Um, if you register on the Ag Data Commons and discover that you want a little bit of help, we have a webinar uh, that's going to be offered November 28th, uh, so you can attend the webinar, but you don't have to. There's also a set of tutorial videos on YouTube. Just search for Ag Data Commons instruction series. Um, we have a data submission guide online. You can always contact us at our uh, joint email box if you want more specific uh, help. Um, but really, I encourage you to just log in and try it. Um, what we're being told when people do this is that it was a lot easier than they thought. Um, as I said, we're trying to reach that middle ground of having more description than you might get in the supplemental uh, you know, paragraph that goes in a paper, but maybe less than you might provide to a resource like GenBank or, or one of the NCBI databases. And just a, one final word is that we have just um, put out on the NAL website uh, guidance on data management plans. And so those of you who are uh, submitting proposals to AFRI in the 2018 fiscal year, you're going to be required to submit a data management plan. If you don't have one already or if you need assistance, we will provide that to you. Um, <coughs> and in addition, I understand that there's interest in providing resources on training for data science. Um, I think that's a great idea. Whether we put that up on the Ag Data Commons or make it a more general NAL web page, I think we can talk. We're in a good collaboration with ag librarians around the country, and so we can come together as a, as a library community to figure out what are those best resources for training that, that all of our folks should, should be able to find. All right, so to find out more about all of this, you can go just to the NAL website and click on data. And with that, I will end and ask if there's any questions. Thanks. Any questions? Well. Can I just talk Yes, you can. So it seems to me that there's getting to be more and more of repositories for data. My own institution is doing one. Mm -hmm. um, do you see, uh, can you imagine pulling these things together in some way? Maybe a repository of repositories? Yeah, I think on the one hand there may be good reasons for different repositories to exist if they have special features for a specific community. Um, for business model reasons, it may be that there needs to be an institutional repository because they actually care about their researchers' um, data. So I'm not sure that we'll ever coalesce into one single you know, massive central repository. But the idea of a central catalog, however we actually implement that, will we'll make it hopefully more seamless and not seem quite so scattered. Um, in my mind, what, when I think about, you know, that, that exciting future, I think, you know, rather than asking each of you to register your data set and fill out the metadata, we should just have a bot that goes out and finds it and extracts the metadata for you or takes it from your instrument, you know, um, file, log files or something. So I think going forward, we're hoping to make it a lot more seamless, the whole research process. Um, it'll be a while before we get there. Um, so it's going to take a while, but I also hope that having a more sustainable central catalog and repository might discourage people from starting something new where it's not needed. So we are regularly here at the library turning away research groups that say, we know we need a custom database with its own web interface because we know people are going to search for our stuff and we want them to search it in a special way. And we can't sustain those. NSF can't sustain those. NIH can't sustain those. Well, maybe they can do better than, than NSF, but in any case, 
what we're offering to people is, you know, that's a great idea, but in the meantime, just park your data someplace that's well described, and if the funding arises or if somebody else gets excited about it and wants to do it, they can do it. But in the meantime, don't create something new. Just park it in an existing repository. You know, I, 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 I've, for three years we've been flying under the radar trying not to promise too much to too many people because we don't have a sense of the demand. Um, I would say it's still early days and sure, if you want to share, what, what we're asking people to do is at least draft something and then give us their draft and then we can provide some feedback on that draft um, and we'll see. Um, part of our business model is we need to demonstrate what the actual demand is and so if we get more demand than we can handle, that's actually a good thing. It sort of, you know, gives us the ammunition we need to get more secure long-term funding. The other thing is actually there's some really interesting library initiatives that are networking ag librarians around the country to help each other out in supporting these kinds of requests. So it's sort of a distributed curation model that we also hope to have for actually curating the data sets as well. So we're thinking about scaling. Anything, any other questions or comments? Okay, Sandy, thank you very much.